So Rocky and what's her name again? Ellie. Rocky and Ellie. So Ellie is the one off camera right now who's doing the barking. Uh, she disagrees with me being here. And she's very protective of one of her guardians. In fact, if her guardian, uh, if the, one of the guardians is in bed and her spouse approaches, she will lunge and nip and try to bite the spouse because she thinks you belong to her. And I, I just got done asking some questions about the day-to-day -day routine. And basically these dogs don't have any rules and they get to tell the guardians when to pet them. Um, and as a result of that, the dogs think that they have the same authority. So listening to the humans is optional. So we're gonna talk about some rules that we can incorporate to help the dog start to see and identify uh, as being a follower. I'm gonna ask you to pan to your left. And uh, so here we have Rocky. Rocky is not only on the couch, he is sitting on the back of the couch. For dogs, the higher we sit, the more rank or status we have. So Rocky does not have the same status as the humans. Rocky has more status than the humans. So for dogs, what I usually suggest, the first rule is no furniture for 30 days. <laughs> At the end of 30 days, you may decide, we kind of like having furniture without dogs. Now you got little dogs, you have Shih Tzus for a reason, you want lap dogs. And there's nothing wrong with the dogs being on the furniture when they are well behaved, but I want them to see this as a privilege and not right now they look at it as this is their birthright. So uh, what, I, what I would, I'm going to show you in a little bit how we can use the dog bed uh, and get them to use the dog bed. They probably don't use it very much because they can have more status sitting up here. So what I uh, do is uh, at, for 30 days, no furniture. At the end of 30 days, if you decide you want them back on the furniture, then you give them furniture, but only per invitation and only for good behavior. So if they're up here and start barking, now you have to immediately get down. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to have you stand, get up and move over to the fireplace. I'm going to show you with Rocky how to get down. And can you grab her and just, uh, we want to give her, she has an injured uh, leg, so we're not going to do the same thing to her that I'm going to do for Rocky uh, because we want to make sure she stays safe. All right, so now Rocky's up on the furniture, and what typically will happen is the dog will come and pause in front of the couch and look up at the couch, and they're, that's basically their same way of saying, if you don't want me on the couch, say something now, or I'm getting up. And you don't say anything, so the dog gets up. Oh, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna have you grab the seat and I'm gonna have you stay there if you could. All right, so now we'll kind of, uh, we'll kind of uh, see if he tries, can you sco scooch over here just a little bit? There we go. We'll see if he tries to come up and I, I'll show you how to disagree. So he was moving there, I disagreed by using the sound. I'm gonna go over why I use that sound in a minute. So uh, one of the dirty secrets of dog behavior is disagreeing with the dog before it starts doing something. Just like us, once we get in the middle of it, we get all worked up, we're talking politics or whatever. If, if we just start talking politics, we're like, hey, let's keep this civil, we stop it right away. You get into a deep argument, whether you like Trump or hate him, off, off. So if he wouldn't have gotten off, what I would have done is put my hand behind, off. I push them to the edge or pull them to the edge, but I don't want to push or pull them all the way off because then I'm or giving an elevator ride. Now for her, we have to because she's injured and she can't get up in the first place. So it's just going to be not, not a pain in the putting her there. But if the dog doesn't get up, I say it once, off. A lot of people I say, okay, tell the dog to get off now. Can we get off the couch, please? Please? And then I say, okay, go behind, put your hand behind them and put, push them firmly to the edge. So they're like, well, the dog's like, she doesn't really want me off, so I'm just going to help her by staying here. So I push firmly, whoops, not all the way off, but I push firmly so the dog's like, oh, I'm about to fall off, so the dog jumps off. I always want the dog to do the work. So rule number one, I would suggest no furniture for 30 days. At the end of 30 days, furniture with an invitation, but per incident and only for good behavior. So if he gets down to go get a drink of water and comes back, he needs another invitation to get back up. Good boy. All right. Rule number two, I always ask a dog to sit before I let them in or out of the door. Off. Now, if he's like here, I'm gonna start this side and I'm gonna walk this way. If, he, I'm here, if he's there and I go this way, he's gonna go all the way around the couch. So always go short to the short side. Um, so for dogs, sitting and laying down are more subordinate positions. So asking the dog to sit is kind of almost like it's a way of saying please. So when I go to the door, I tell the dog sit and I say it literally like an order. A lot of people like put inflection in their voice or they literally ask, can you sit? The dog's like, oh no, not right now. So sit, if the, and let's say that Rocky sit, or let's say that uh, Ellie sits and Rocky does not. Well then I would open the door, let Ellie out, and Rocky does not get to go out. Now if I stand there waiting, then he knows I'm waiting on him. 
So then I walk away, sit down, pull out your computer, an iPad, or whatever it is, and mess around for one minute, turn the TV on, and ignore him. If even if he's barking, we're not going to say a word. Then we're going to go back to the door and give him another opportunity to sit. Only one opportunity, though. If he doesn't sit, then I'm going to walk away for two minutes. Next time for four minutes. Next time for eight minutes. So each time he doesn't comply on the first command, he has to wait twice as long before he gets another opportunity. Do you guys eat uh, at this table? Occasionally. When you're eating, where are the dogs? Probably right next to you, right? Yeah. Or right on the floor. Yeah. For dogs, just like if your wife were to go and change clothes and I were to go follow and you'd be like, dude, what are you doing? That's my <laughs> wife. I'm just going to watch at, from the doorway. Still inappropriate. So we need boundaries and distances and same thing for dogs when, you're, when they're eating. For dogs, eating is a very primarily important activity. If a dog comes within seven feet of another dog who's eating, the dog who's eating is going to start growling. And a lot of people think this is food aggression. It's not. It's saying, hey. I'm eating, back off, like you would say, hey, that's my wife, stay away. So um, when you guys are eating, if the dog's within seven feet of you, even if it's not begging, it's inappropriate. The way dogs try to take things from other dogs is intimidating. They invade their personal space. So my rule would be, because you have this carpet here, if you want to kind of shoot down the carpet, I would say that when, I uh, try to keep it sideways, yeah. Uh, uh, I would say that when you're eating, they're not allowed to come within this kind of square. So this area becomes no man land. If they try to come in, I'm going to give you some escalating consequences, ways for you to disagree, and ask them to get away. But the key is to disagree before they break it. So as they're approaching a boundary, I make the hissing sound. Once they violate it, then I'm going to probably stand up and march towards the dog until it backs away. Um, adding structure to things that they want to do or asking them to wait or ask permission is a great way to incorporate it uh, because it's something you're going to do over and over thousands of times throughout the dog's life. If you just get in the habit of doing it, then it's a little mini training session every time you do or you know, enforce that particular rule. Uh, same thing with the kitchen. Like if you're cooking a meal, I'm sure they're in there. If it smells good, they want to be right there. So you can establish a rule. Hey, you're not allowed to come in the kitchen when we're cooking, and we're going to do it where there is nothing blocking them but air. So that they have to control themselves. That helps them with control, disagreeing with skateboards that are coming by, or people, uh, sound that's outside the door. So I don't have to go bark at every little living yeah. thing. So having rules and structure will actually remove their stress, help them see that you guys have the situation under control, and then they don't have to be so reactive. They can just defer to you guys to handle the skateboard coming by. Well, my parents aren't, seeing, aren't upset about this. They're relaxed and they're not disagreeing, so I'm gonna follow their lead. So that's a quick little synopsis of uh, how we can uh, incorporate rules and structure to help the dog start to see and identify us as uh, authority figures.